I was raised in a barn. Oftentimes when you misbehave or you're messy, people say, what are you raised in a barn? And I took that a little bit personally because quite literally I was raised in a barn. I share a roof with my horses, up to 12 sometimes, and I grew up as a rodeo cowgirl. I grew up riding horses and tying goats and barrel racing, and my family was so normal to me because isn't everyone's dad a horse trainer? And isn't it perfectly normal to be an eight-year-old with a shiner and a concussion because your horse kicked you in the head? Is that just not perfectly normal? I'm a first-generation college student as well, and so when I went off to the University of Missouri and began to volunteer, I didn't realize that my experiences were abnormal. I began to volunteer at the local Boys and Girls Club where I later discovered that 74% of the boys wanted to be a rapper or a football player. I grew up riding horses and doing ballet folk political folk dancing and public speaking. And those kinds of experiences shaped my outlook. But these children didn't have those kinds of experiences and I wanted so badly to bring that to them. We, in some ways, were very similar. I'm a first-generation college student. Many of the at-risk youth that I was working with were first-generation college student. I call them at-risk youth because that's a term that you recognize, but I don't like that term very much. I believe that the only thing they're at risk of is taking over the world if we give them the right tools. <laughs> However, we do have very many similarities. I, we didn't talk about college a lot in my household. Uh, we, in my house, we talked about horses, not higher ed. We talked about cows, not college. We talked about goats and not grades. But it was, when I started this program, I decided to bring in college students to expose the children to things like fencing and engineering and accounting. And we named that project Dream Outside the Box. I thought that Dream Outside the Box would be once a week for four weeks. And it evolved into this college student organization eventually. And then when I graduated college, I decided that this needed to be my full-time job. So I set out to move home to Texas and establish Dream Outside the Box in my home state of Fort Worth. And it was the hardest thing that I've ever done. Every single meeting was a challenge. And I'd had success before. I'd been to the White House, I'd been featured on all these things, and I thought, oh, I, I really know what I'm doing now. But when I moved home and tried to start over, there was this myriad of challenges. And so when I was asked to do a TED Talk, the first, I, I, knew, I knew immediately, the first thing that came to my mind was success in hot mess, because that just made sense to me. Everything in my life was hot mess, but there were sprinkles of relative success. But really, when I thought about the essence of what I was doing and the things that were, made it success, everything was drawn back to things that people who were wiser than me, more experienced than me, had taught me. Or they were things that I'd passed on to the students that I worked with. And then I began to, re began to realize it's not about success because success is relative. It's not about hot mess because Let's just be real, success in hot mess would be a hot mess in itself of a topic. <laughs> but it's about those experiences of having that conversation with people and having those things in my toolbox. And so that's why I decided to name the TED Talk Mentorship Can Change the World. Because I believe that. I believe that there are all of these things that we can do. We can create cures for cancer. We can create all of these things. But how does a little girl who was raised in a barn riding bareback and barefoot get to this, get to shaking hands with the president and talking to him about Mizzou basketball? It's mentorship. Everything that led me to doing what I do now and doing what I do on a daily basis was guidance and support and Every opportunity that I had to sit down face to face with someone and ask those questions or every time that I made a mistake and thought, what would insert mentor here do? Or sometimes, and I've, I'll 
talk about this a bit more, sometimes your mentors aren't someone that you talk to on a daily basis. You know, honestly, I'm watching the show Scandal right now, and Olivia Pope is my mentor, and I am watching this TV character, and she's kind of guiding the thing. So it's, you can have imaginary mentors and fictional mentors. There are all kinds of mentors, but that model, these archetypes, are what can guide your life. And so I believe that your parents are your original mentors. My parents are pictured at the bottom of this pyramid and they've instilled these values in me. And for the first 17 years of my life before I was, went off to college, they had their own way of shaping my destiny. My parents taught me things that I would carry in this backpack with me to school, the life lessons, the manners, the little ways that you tug down your skirt that you learn from your mom and the way that your dad I'll be honest with you and tell you a little secret. My dad is a cowboy, a stereotypical cowboy, Wrangler jeans every day. But my dad taught me about walking in heels because he said, no daughter of mine is going to be wobbling like that. So he said, I've never done this before, but I think you have to stand tall with your back straight and, and guide. So you never know where that foundation comes from. And he was doing this in jeans, boots, in the barn with a horse tied up next to him. So these foundations, everything that's in your backpack is that first layer to your journey and on your proverbial ride to success, relative success. However, your parents, your family, your guardians, I put my parents because they were the most influential people to me, but it could be an aunt, it can be a sister. And Family doesn't have to be blood. I have family members in the audience today who I met here in Columbia when I came off to school. So that foundation that you get the first 18 or so years of your life provide that first layer. But I went off to college at 17, 13 hours away from home in an environment that was so foreign to me. We never talked about college. I didn't know what a classroom was going to look like. I didn't know what to expect and test and grades. And then on top of that, to end up starting a nonprofit my freshman year, there was no way that I could conceive of how to do that. I was sitting in a leadership class, and a woman said on that panel, the best thing that you can do for yourself is find a mentor. And she was pretty high up on the proverbial, I mean, I love this word proverbial today, but <laughs> pretty high up on the ladder of people at Mizzou, and I was a little bit nervous, and I knew it was a long shot, but I emailed her and said, you said we should find a mentor. Will you be mine? And she emailed back and said, yes, sure, and that was the first step. And she's pictured on this pyramid today, and every woman on that pyramid is one of my mentors, and they've shaped the experiences that I've had. They've taught me things that I would never have learned before and things that my parents simply couldn't. And my parents are appreciative of that. It's not a matter of lack of knowledge or ignorance or anything like that. It's building upon and scaffolding your education. Your mentors provide this guidance and the opportunity to really instill things and put them in your toolbox. But then you have your own experiences. You fall, you make mistakes, you have your own self-interest. And so you build upon that mentorship middle and you have your self-summit. There are things that you think in your head that inform your everyday decisions. There are things that you decide are important to you. And those kinds of things, the mistakes that you make when no one's watching, that is just as important as mentorship, the education that you give yourself. When you talk to yourself and self-correct and think about those kinds of things or reflect on your day at the end when your head hits the pillow. So I challenge you to think about mentorship in your life. What does that look like to you? What has your role been? And I assert that each and every one of you can or will be a mentor at some point in your life. Every, each and every one of you should be a mentor. Each and every one of you are not ready right now to be a mentor, and that's okay. But we, as 
people as learners, as growers, have to begin to think about the world beyond ourselves. And there's so much knowledge out there for us to soak in. And there's so much for us to give. So when we think about mentorship and we think about how that works, we have to begin to ask ourselves, what are your strengths? There's a number of different ways that you can come about that, whether it's the strengths quest assessment that says that your top five strengths are ideator or inputs or whatever it may be. Or you can, you know, you know if you're a good communicator, you know if you're extroverted, you know those kind of things. And if you don't know, ask someone else. I had a coworker ask me the other day, what do you consider to be your best strengths? And I told him what I thought, and he said, well, I don't know, I don't have any strengths. That's not true, and I began to tell him all of these things that he was able to kind of put in his toolbox and think about. The reason that you want to know your strengths is so that, not that you have to focus on that to impart on other people, but you want to be able to have a sense of what you can share and what it is that you want someone to be able to take away from you. And in those strengths, the opposite of that are weaknesses. And sometimes our mentees help to build our weaknesses. And sometimes our mentees have strengths that we don't. And it's a reciprocal relationship, a feedback loop, if you will. The next thing I'd like you to think about is the biggest mistake that you've made. Ladies, maybe that's um, a fall. Maybe that's a bad decision in the office. Maybe that's the inability to delegate. That was one of mine. I, I, when I first started Dream Outside the Box, I thought it was the best to do everything. The better, I was gonna be a better leader if I did every single thing and that made me cooler or stronger, which is not true. It was a mistake. And now every single person that comes be behind me, I have the opportunity to say, no, 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 delegate. It will save your life. And those kinds of things, or make sure that you don't do this or don't do that. The best thing about mistakes is the thing that happens on the other side, saving someone from making those same mistakes that you've made. It's worth it to make a mistake if you can save someone on the other end. And then you have to begin to ask yourself, what gets you fired up? What makes you excited? Because those are the kinds of things that you want to seek out in those mentorship relationships. You can't mentor someone if you don't have common interest. And if your mentees are excited about something and you're excited about something and you find each other, it's going to be a stronger relationship. What gets you fired up is something that will thrive and grow within you. What gets me fired up is mentorship now, but also the idea that other people are coming behind me and deciding to start organizations and changing the world. And I'm not gonna be here forever, but there's gonna be a whole generation of people behind me who are able to make a difference. I meet with students every time I'm back in Columbia and it makes me excited that everyone is on this social entrepreneurship path. But I began to see that there were a dis there was a disconnect between sometimes what a student thought was a idea for an organization and what could actually be something. And so I decided that in order for us to have a mentor and mentee relationship, we had to be able to visualize what a nonprofit looked like and then begin to see if that worked. And so we kind of came up with this model for change. So if a student could fill out this one, two, three step and say, what the problem was that they wanted to face. If they were coming to me and saying, Cam, I want you to help me with this organization, if they could fill out that problem, and if they had an appropriate attraction, and if there was some kind of spin on it that made it unique, I was fired up, I was excited. And, and it's honestly very rare that we're able to make it all the way to that bottom thing, because everyone wants to start a new youth program. But are, is there a need for it? The lack of mentorship is a common problem in our communities. Teenagers who need grown-up mentors or college students. But how are we going to make it different? How are we going to make a change? And this particular student's model for change got me fired up. 
And then you have to begin to think about what are your golden rules. In terms of a mentor-mentee reciprocal relationship, I only have one rule, and that's humility. When I decide that I'm going to invest time in a student, I want to see that that student is concerned with their community and the world around them and not self-glorification and success. I don't want you to be my mentee because you're trying to get to the White House or you're trying to get accolades or those kinds of things. But my golden rules are these things that help to inform that. They're the things that your parents taught you. My dad always says it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. When I was a young little rodeo cowgirl, I used to walk around strutting around every time I got a blue ribbon. And I wasn't very nice to the little girls that were following me like the Pied Piper. And my dad kind of snatched me up a little bit and said, wait a minute, it's nice to be important, but more important to be nice. And that stayed with me my entire life. And so even when you're having a bad day or even when you feel like you're a celebrity or whatever it may be, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. And I tell this to every single one of my mentees. I also tell them that if you take care of these four years, they'll take care of you. That's a, something that my mom told me that was in high school. If I took care of those four, they'd take care of me. And that was something for college. If I took care of those four years, they'd take care of me. One of the greatest pieces of advice, of advice that I got from a mentor was that leadership is the ability to walk away from something and it not fail. And at the time, I wasn't a leader when I was trying, when I couldn't delegate and do those kinds of things. But these things, these principles about sustainability and growth and those kinds of things are something that I would have never gained on my own. And it took a while for me to process that. But that's what mentorship is all about, learning, humility, and growth. And then finally, if you work hard and are kind, amazing things will happen. That's a bonus, and that's something that I hope that my mentees will begin to operate on. So then I ask you, who have been your mentors? And they provide a guideline for you and a template for you. But that you begin to think about who have been your mentors and who you want to be. It's a loop. First, you're a mentee. You're tutored. You're the young grasshopper. And then you become the sensei or however it works. You're the mentor. And then you're a grand mint. Please forgive me. I, of course, made that word up. But you have a grand mentee that's the person that came after you. And so it's a loop. And if we follow this loop, if we begin to instill in other people, if we begin to pass on those strengths to other people, mentorship will change the world, not just can. Thank you.